Hello, friends in C3, West Michigan. I hope this finds you very well. Um, we're going to be talking today a little bit about the good. I know that you've been going through various words over the last while, and uh, the word for today is the good. Um, I'm going to record this in two short videos because I don't think my computer would cope with co with uh, recording a full half hour and then trying to trans transfer that. Um, I'm in fairly rural Ireland and our uh, <laughs> our upload speeds are pretty poor, so I don't know if it would get there um, by tomorrow. Anyway, uh, the first half I'm going to look at a scriptural text and I have seven or eight different thoughts inside myself about the promises and problems of looking at any scriptural text. It is certainly a literature of power and a literature that has caused much damage as well as perhaps promising much delight. So we're going to look at that. And then for the second half, we're going to look at, I'm going to read some poems, all centred around the question of good. and What does it mean? So here is the scriptural text. It's from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, which was the earliest gospel written, we think, written perhaps around the year 65 or 70. Mark 10, verse 17 to 22. As he was setting out on a journey, a man came up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I've done all these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. So just to reiterate, um, I'm turning to this text because it's an old one, because it's a literature of the world, and because it is a meditation on the good. Not because I think, A, there's a singular interpretation, or B, that reading a gospel text implies that anybody should need to follow what the gospel proposes as its way. I, I think that looking at these texts through the lens of literature often yields um, surprising and interesting features of the literature. So first, just to think about this man, an interesting character, he runs up and he kneels. Such interesting verbs used about him. Uh, where else do we think of, maybe in the Gospel of Mark, maybe in other texts um, within the Gospel genre, where there's running and kneeling? And then he says, good teacher, and what must I do to inherit eternal life? And that, interestingly, isn't about the good. It's about the reward for the good. I'm willing to do anything I can to get the reward. Why was eternal life of interest to him? What did he think eternal life was? What imagination did he have of whatever eternal life was? There was then and now absolutely no consensus as to what eternal life means. For some people, that's hell. That's torture. My God, living with my family for the rest of my life. For other people, it's a way to deal with their absolute fear in the face of death. Who knows? We're talking about all kinds of things in the here and now when we talk about the hereafter. And the hereafter is often a substitute and a projection, I think. Um... Lots of questions about eternal life in the gospel genres are absolute abstractions and distractions. For myself, I don't think about heaven much. Um, and mostly the experiences I had of talking about heaven when I was younger were ones of oppression. They were a way of distancing from the everyday in order to talk about a certain utopia. And that utopia was usually defined by whoever was defining it. So a place where there'll be no gay people, a place where there'll be no, as they would have been called, non-Catholics, uh, etc., etc. And so, again, the way of talking about the hereafter is a profound way of establishing questions about what you think is good in the here and now, but not 
being accountable for it um, because you can just blame it all on God. So sometimes versions of heaven that we've heard about seem nice. <laughs> Other times, definitely not. But I do think they are usually a projection of whoever is talking and a neat way of speaking about and making a declaration of power today without bearing accountability for it or taking responsibility. Um, for myself, I'm much more influenced by other religions like Judaism and others who have a really healthy dose of agnosticism about the question of an afterlife to go, we don't know. If that's the only reason you're part of it, it's probably not a good reason to be part of it. Um, so why are you part of it? Why are you living now? So back to this man. Um, he's asked a question about how to get a reward and he's called Jesus good. Agathos is the word in Greek used here. It's where we get the English name Agatha, I think, although that might also come from, from Latin. Something similar, really, meaning precious. But the word Agathos here from Greek can be translated as good or moral or great or noble. But interestingly, the word Agathos here can also be translated into this much more subtle word, and complex word and ambivalent word, which is useful. Useful Jesus. What must I do to get a reward? <laughs> that might be one of the layers underneath this question. I think Jesus of Nazareth's psychology was so interesting because somehow, and I would be interested in knowing him because I would ask him then, how did you get to that level of being able to hear quickly multiple layers in questions that are happening and not only to deconstruct them but to take them deeper. He seems to have had a curiosity in taking conversations like this one, an interruption, deeper. He would probably have been frustrating to have known if you were going somewhere else, going to an appointment, going to a meal because whoever shouted at him sometimes might have been subject to a curious question in response to their question which perhaps Jesus of Nazareth often implies wasn't curious enough. So would he have been useful and for what really is the question? Um, I recently got followed on Instagram by a pop star who's very famous amongst teenagers. And these days I get loads of messages on Instagram saying, hello, lovely Podrick. I see that you're followed by famous pop star and famous pop star is my son's favorite famous pop star. Could you please reach out to the famous pop star and get him to sing happy birthday or listen to my son's demo or do a shout out? My son's had a hard year and if you do this for us, you'd make our year so much better. I have gotten so many, um, so many messages like that of one variety or another from a friend, from a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, etc. And in this instance, I often go back to um, perhaps echoing Jesus <laughs> to go wondering, why are they calling me lovely? So, you know, or hello, great pottery or whatever. Do you know, it's a way of buttering up. And I don't think they mean lovely. Um, I think they mean useful or potentially lovely, provided you answer my emotionally manipulative message, which may or may not actually be true. <laughs> so, um I ignore those messages, um, proving perhaps that whatever that definition of lovely is, I'm not. And definitely proving that whatever definition of um, useful is, I'm not going to be useful to them. And I think Jesus um, gives this young man an interesting answer because Jesus says to this young man, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And then he lists off the commandments, boom, 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 boom which is, in a certain sense, uh, another way of saying, what are you looking for? And Jesus doesn't give any promises. He just says, you know what to do. Um, there seems to have been a certain kind of intuitive knowing between them. And then the man speaks again, and some interesting things happen. He doesn't call him good teacher this time. He just says, teacher, I've kept all these commandments since I was younger. And why this strange omission? Why, having called him good teacher at the start, does he not call him good teacher now? Uh, years ago, I was given an interpretation of this. Um, 
And the person said, look, it's because the young man didn't recognize Jesus as God. He just saw Jesus as a teacher, like a secular teacher or a human person. And therefore, this young man or this rich man is like anybody who wants to live a good life, but doesn't want to attribute that to their Christianity. And I suppose I want to say, first of all, is that the the reading of that is a close one because the person who gave me this reading paid close enough attention to see the modification from good teacher to teacher. They were reading closely. I don't conclude um, the same thing that they concluded from a close reading. Um, it is true the man modified what he called Jesus from good teacher to just teacher. And what does that mean? That he didn't believe Jesus was God? It's entirely plausible. I've spoken to loads of people who think they're God and I don't believe them either. And I suppose I want to say that I don't know if Jesus believed he was God. Um, the Gospels do say that, kind of, mostly, but there's ambivalence. And anyway, the Gospels were written at least 35, 40 years. This one anyway, Mark's Gospel. Others were later. John's was later still. And the later the Gospels got, the more sure of Jesus being God Jesus becomes in those literatures. So what, what would the real experience have been like? And then certainly other people, um, Jesus's friends, um, had all kinds of curiosities and frustrations, I think, um, about who Jesus was and what he was and what his message was and what did it mean in the here and now? What did it mean about politics and occupation? So I don't want to judge this man who's come up to Jesus um, through a lens of, did he have the answer right about Jesus? Because I don't think... I'm interested in having the answer right about Jesus. And I think there's other questions that are more interesting. Um, what it shows me is that he called Jesus something good or useful, <laughs> teacher. How can I get a reward? And Jesus challenged his language. And what's interesting is that the man heard the challenge and modified his language. Um, he was perhaps caught up in somebody else's addiction as to what reward should be and how to get it. And Jesus kind of pierced that balloon and the man noticed that and immediately changed his language, which goes to say that in the in the category of categories, Jesus and this man were, had an intellectual and I think emotional attraction to each other to go check it out. You got the message. We're troubled by the same question. What does it mean to be good or to do good? And the guy seems to say, OK, OK, look, I, I leave the reward bit out of the question. What, what must I do? Because I've been doing all of these things all along and I'm still not sure. And what's he still not sure about? He's still not sure what he's supposed to do, what the good is. Why should you do the good? For reward or for satisfaction or for moral obligation? Why should you? And also... Who am I? And what does it mean to live with questions in a life? Rilke, in one of the early poems in the Prayers of the Hours, says, I've been circling around God, that primordial tower. I've been circling for a thousand years and I still do not know. Am I a falcon? A storm? Or a great song? I think this man was filled with a profound question about what does it mean to live a good life here and now? And Jesus was trying to um, take him away from the distraction of reward and heaven by asking him to look at his own life. It says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. So I think there was a deep respect and attraction between these two characters. And then Jesus says something impossible, give everything away. And I think it's good to be generous, but I don't know that that's the message here. Um, I think Jesus was saying something to, again, push things for him, to put him into a situation where he had to evaluate, um, what do I really want? And what's most important? What reward do I think I want? What's good? And what if the good leads to something that doesn't feel very satisfactory? Will I do it anyway? <laughs> And what if the good leads to my death? That certainly was a question that Jesus of Nazareth was asking himself and I think struggling with. And what if the good leads to an obscurity 
Or what if the um, fame or the accolades I wish for lead to nothing because I realize something else is more important? What if I'm called to obscurity, not particularity? Will I do it anyway? And these are the things I think that Jesus is troubling into. Asking, why do you think something is good? How do you decide? What is the reward in that for you? And what are you doing it for? It's not to say that there's an easy set of answers to this. I don't think there is a tick box exercise that you can do. But there is a secular value, I think, in asking these profound questions. And I think there's a secular value, which is why I use it, in using these ancient religious texts to ask questions about what it means to live in the here and now. I suppose I also think of um, undoing questions like Jesus has done here with this man. I think so many other questions are worthy of being undone. Do you believe in God, for instance? Or is that person a member of the same religion as me? Or underneath all of that is, um, will you get into heaven? Do you have certitude? Um, these were questions that I was troubled by, by people who were trying to convert me in my youth. And I think I used to want to have clever answers, but now I'm not even interested in the clever answers because I think there are deeper questions. Um, what does it mean to be me? What does it mean to live well? What do I do with the gifts and talents that I have? Um, what do I do with privilege? What do I do with luck? How aggressive am I when it comes to pursuing what I say I want? Do I even want what I say I want? How do I live my life? And what do I think death is? And how does that influence the way I live my life? So these are questions, I think, that are far more important than some of the surface level questions. And I don't know entirely what it means for the good, except that it troubles it. And that is good enough for me. Back in a minute with some poems. So we're back and um, I'm going to read three poems for you. Um, this first one is called Who for Us Men and for Our Salvation. Um, I used to think that it would be good if people started to invite more gay people to speak in religious places. And then I started to get invitations from religious spaces that were cool and funky. You know, the, the person, the man in charge might have, you know, had tattoos and liked whiskey or yoga or trendy coffee or craft beer. or uh, might have been cool or wanted to be seen to be cool with the gays. But um, these places would sooner have a gay man, a man that they probably thought was some kind of um, sexual depraved person like me. Um, these places seem to be more keen to have someone like me speak than to have a woman speak. Maybe a woman from their congregation, maybe a woman more qualified than they, or maybe a woman who actually believes the same conservative theology than they. They would rather have somebody who they probably consider on a certain sense to be perhaps heretical or um, maybe on their way to hell. They'd rather have a man speak like that than to have a woman speak, which um, I suppose it, it stopped me thinking about what the performance of inclusion looked like. And it, it troubled the question about what the good of inclusion looks like if it's not asking good questions. So this is a little sonnet. It's not written about one person in particular. It's written about a, a whole category of kind of invitations that I was getting for a period of my life. It's called Who For Us Men and Our Salvation. You drink whiskey during poker nights. Wear shirts your granddad wore. Display the ink that's on your unshaved chest and sign your texts to me with X's. You drink coffee from a little glass after early morning yoga class. You podcast authenticity and live in parts of the city that others have disdained. You disdain, disdain. You oil your beard. You wear 1930s shoes bought for a small fortune in a place you say your granddad would have loved. Like him, you believe a woman's place is not behind the pulpit. Let her lecture in literature. Let her explore the stars. Let her drink. Let her work. But 
Do not let her speak the verb of God in public. Let her mostly be. And that little phrase at the end, the verb of God, comes directly from Irish in, in Mass or in other um, religious services where a reading might finish with, in English, saying this is the word of the Lord. Um, in Irish you say, Shabri her day, meaning this is the verb of God. I wonder sometimes if it was translated like that in the 60s after Vatican II, because if you were to try to say this is the word of God, you would have to say Shafakal day. And I wonder if um, they didn't want that to be sounded out in Irish speaking masses around the country. Anyway, here are two poems that are companion poems. This first one is called The Famine and it's got the word potato in it too, but potatoes crossed out. So it's the crossed out potato famine. Um, the famine in Ireland from 1845 for the next three years really particularly but then really for the next four decades five decades in terms of the impact that that famine had was a terrible thing and it was not a potato famine the potato crop failed because of a blight absolutely a blight is a kind of a rot that goes into the potato plant through the underside of its leaves goes down and rots the potato um, and then causes the leaves to turn white but um, there was plenty of food going out from Ireland 60% of the corn and something like 65% of the beef that was being um, consumed in Britain was coming from Ireland. So Ireland was this mass producing farm during that particular period of time, huge rural population and there was plenty of food to go around. And so I've been wanting to write about this for a long time. And so here's the first of two poems that are reflecting on that and um, Sometimes I think we call something or history calls something or politics calls something like a potato famine to actually ignore the fact that it was a policy famine. And I always want to question what something is called because that too can be a cover. Um, in the first year of the, the famine in Ireland, Frederick Douglass actually was visiting Ireland. And this is what he said in 1845. I can truly say I've spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. The entire absence of anything that looked like prejudice against me on account of the colour of my skin contrasted so strongly with my long and bitter experience in the United States that I look with wonder and amazement on the transition. He gave that speech in Ireland in 1845. So here's a poem. It's a villanelle. Um, it uses the word spuds, which is what we call potatoes. So, My father likes his spuds piled high upon his plate. My mother likes her peace and her diet magazines. My great-great-granddad was the only one who made it. At the heart of every famine is the scheming of a state to bring a people to their knees for the state's convenience. My father liked his spuds piled high upon his plate. On the phone, an English woman says the Irish are fixated with our stories of the past in a way that's quite obscene. But my great-great-granddad was the only one who made it. My auntie moved to England and learned how to translate between the way a people are and the way their history's been. My father likes his spuds piled high upon his plate. There are proteins in our grass from forgotten famine graves. Some families fed on rotten grass and, my mother tells me, my granddad's granddad was the only one who made it. His family had all starved, so he missed his confirmation. Decades later, a priest arranged it, didn't make a scene. My father likes his spuds piled high upon his plate. My great great granddad was the only one who made it. I think if pursuing the good means anything, it does mean asking inconvenient questions. For instance, asking who called a famine that was dictated really by a government in London, who called that a potato famine? It's never been called that in Ireland. We call it on Gert the Moor, the Great Hunger. Who called the new world, the new world. 
it wasn't new at all. It was as old as the rest of the world with people who were living there with all kinds of cultures and language and political arrangements that were functioning in the way that these things function. Not perfect, but also not necessary of being so-called redeemed by European expansionism. Speaking of which, um, here's the next poem in this pair. This poem is called Phytophthora infestans. Um, it's the Latin name for the potato blight. Um, this poem also wants to trouble something and it wants to trouble Irishness because one of the things that I've noticed in Irishness and I know that this will be no news to many of you but to lots of people in Ireland I've noticed that because we've suffered under colonisation our language was taken really or it's, uh, influenced to be diminished in a way that has caused a, an extraordinary collapse and fluency in Ireland of our own language um, in favour of English I've noticed that sometimes I hear people imagining that because we've suffered under colonisation that therefore Irish people are the friends of the suffering elsewhere. And here's what Frederick Douglass had to say about that in 1853. You remember what I read just a few minutes ago um, that he said in 1845 at his visit to Ireland. Um, over the next few years, um, hundreds of thousands of Irish people landed on the shores of the United States. And this is what Frederick Douglass said in 1853 eight years after that. The Irish, who at home readily sympathise with the oppressed everywhere, are instantly taught when they step upon our soil to hate and despise the Negro. They are taught to believe that he eats the bread that belongs to them. Sir, the Irish American will find out his mistake one day. He will find that in assuming our avocation, he has also assumed our degradation. It's an extraordinary challenging of what sometimes can be the imagination that the suffering will necessarily know what the good is. I can't speak for the, the condition of the world or the condition of all suffering, but I can certainly speak to what it means to be an Irish person who has to pay attention to Irish accountability, where despite the fact that we suffered under colonisation, we have to pay attention too to the reality that for many decades, centuries, we have also been causing suffering as suffering people. So here is a pantoum, it's a Malaysian form of poems. We love to blame the British for our past, a past that's blighted by a story we won't own. God knows it wasn't that our suffering was mild at home, but when we traveled, we shacked up with empire and smite at other places while crying about our home. Not with a rot of other people's making, but with a rot our own, and not because of how an empire shackled us, but because of something rotten in us. Certainly a rot of other people's making, not our own, starved us from our villages and homes, but because of something rotten in us, and not a blight that was exploited, we went and starved other peoples from their villages and homes. Our suffering was far from mild at home. Far from home, we uncovered something white inside us. We love to blame the Brits for the stories we won't own. Th these poems are written for me, I suppose. I, I have no imagination as to what they do for others. Um, and I can't control that anyway. I suppose what I'm trying to do in these poems is to recognise that a certain form of internal displacement in the personal experience when you're in a situation of power is, is a really important thing. And I suppose I, I think that it needs to be sought. If if the way that I am living my life um, presents to me things that are convenient for my politics, I suppose I, I feel like that's an invitation to ask some serious questions. Um, here, I'll finish with this poem. Uh, this poem is called Let the Waters Swarm with a Swarm of Living Beings, uh, kind of a, an arrangement of language that I've stolen from um, the book of Genesis. And this is um, in response, really, I think, to the idea that any text can be convenient for your life. I 
think, perhaps one of the point of texts, certainly these texts of the world, these texts from various world traditions, I, I think one of their invitations is to is to seek the discomforting. Let the water swarm with a swarm of living beings. I've been swimming round here for a while now, and while I've never touched the ocean floor, I've tried. You notice things out here, the way the wind makes waves chop at odd angles, the way the water feels warmer at the top the way the moon makes music when you're half dead with cold, the ways of frozen bones, the way the morning never feels the same. Once a seal bumped me, came right up to me like a sea puppy, and I swear it smiled. I was floating happy after that. I said the ocean was my home. Then the storm came, then the waves, then the lightning spiked the surface, thunder clapped, hungry beasts swam round me. I saw seagulls eyeing me for scraps. We'll be back in a few minutes to have some conversation together. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, thanks very much for being together for this time. <laughs>